welcome you to this panel discussion. Um, this was um, initially sponsored uh, through a conversation that Lisa and I had many months ago, um, sponsored by the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art. And we are here to talk about the theme for the a show itself, which is disc art made from discarded materials. So without too much uh, fanfare here, I'm just going to introduce the panel, the panel members so you know a little bit about each of them. And then I'll ask a question and get the ball rolling. Um, so first off, we have Deborah Monk. She is the juror of the show, as you probably already know. She is the um, artist in residence. She runs the artist in residence program for Recology, which is in San Francisco. And she's been doing that since about 2007. She also manages the Environmental Learning Center, which does outreach and education to about 4,000 children and adults each year about environmental issues. Um, she has a degree in, as it relates to environment and media, kind of. Kind of. Media yeah, education, education or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm trying to get it You're right. Good, though. But anyway, she's fantastic. She's been the juror for this show, and um, uh, she's been involved since day one. Um, then we have Ezra Jean Black to my second, to my left. She's a staff writer for Artillery Art Magazine in Los Angeles. She's a writer, critic, investigative, re investigative researcher, and blogger in art, film, and the mu music biz, based in LA. And I would talk endlessly more about her, but her bio is real short, so I just got everything I could in there. <laughs> I'm sure she'll, she's, she's... I write about fashion, too. Yeah. And then we have Liz Gordon, who is next to Deborah Muck. Liz uh, puts on the an annual Diverted Destruction show at the loft at Liz's, um, which is... There you go. Um, she's put it on for the last six years, and um, she just ran an assemblage uh, uh, event this this afternoon before we got here, and, and I've apparently there's been a lot of great art that was made from that. She um, her gallery at the loft at the loft at Liz's is over her um, antique hardware store, and she she's got one of the mu most unique gallery spaces in Los Angeles. You have to go look at it. Um, this year's Diverted Destruction show was co-curated by. Mara Hollingsworth from the California African American Museum. And there's a documentary that she produced that um, talks all about diverted destruction that you can probably see on the, the, um, the Ojai Art Festival Facebook page. Then we have Shina Nistembro. I, I don't, I sometimes I don't know if I pronounce her name right, but she's right next to me. She's an art critic. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Especially an art critic. I've known her for like three years, but I still don't know. You don't have to read the whole thing. Can I just read a little bit of it? All right. She's a curator, curator and author based in LA. She edits for a White Hot Magazine, contributing editor for Art Limited. She writes for VS Magazine and the LA Weekly. And she's also a contributor to KCET's program, Artbound which is a fantastic program uh, on TV. I don't know if it comes up here, but it probably does. And then we have Peter Frank. Peter Frank is uh, the co-founder with me of the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art, and he was the first person we brought on the panel um, and the person who drove us up here. Thank you. Blame it on me. Yeah. <laughs> He's an art critic for the Huffington Post, an associate editor for Fabric Magazine, he used to write for the Village Voice in New York City before he escaped mm -hmm. to LA in around 1980 something. Um, he is putting. He used to be the, the senior curator at the Riverside Art Museum, and uh, in April he's. I'm I'm helping a little bit on a, on a show that he's doing at the German Museum called. Bill Helm Morgner House. In in, in uh, yeah. Zoos. Zoos, Germany in April. So. Um, and he's taught at many of the UC schools around, including UCSB, UC Irvine, things like that. Okay, so Joshua Short, the artist sitting next to Peter, he's um, he's doing some work around town that you've probably seen. Um, he's um, won several awards. He graduated from UCA Davis in 2009, 
and he's the founding member of the Cardboard Institute of Technology. <laughs> the piece that he's doing this week is using recycled cardboard. Uh, so we're very happy to have him on the panel. And then, of course, Joseph Umali Fernandez is an LA-based artist who, who's also doing a piece of sculpture around that you may have seen. Um, he's showed and performed at MoCA, done st stuff for us at VICA, at the Barnesville Art Park, the Trump Gallery, and a whole bunch throughout Southern California. Okay, and finally, myself, I'm, I'm an artist and a writer and a, cur a sometime curator, and um, you can read it, my and bio on the, and a filmmaker, and you can read my bio on the website, I don't want to go too much into it, but I appreciate everybody being here, and uh, first, the first thing I'd like to do is ask you, uh, Deborah, what it was like to jury the show, and how it, um, how it, how it may or may not have affected your work or your, you know, because you've come a far distance to jury a whole bunch of wonderful artists who put their, you know, heart and soul into um, the work that using recycled materials. And how do you feel? Um, how do you feel it's, it's it's worked out for you? It was a challenge because we everything was online. So usually, and I, and I didn't. I don't know any of the names of the artists. I didn't have any background in each of those names of the artists in our program. I know a lot about them, and I can do a lot of research, and I can have access to the actual objects, but I, I didn't. So it was just really based on the quality of the photographs that the artist sent in, and then the, and then the image. And then, um, so that was, and, and then and then Chris, Chris, wherever Chris is, said, oh, you need to choose 40, and you have to curate them from San Francisco. So he had 40 um, venues in the city, in Ojai. So he and Uka came up, and we looked on the computer, and I looked at one picture of the venue and a picture of the artist said, oh, that will go there. Oh, <laughs> and that will go, so it was very challenging, but um, also very exciting. And um, uh, so I'd like to um, put a question to the group. Um, I'd, I'd like to put this exhibit and the work itself of, of art made from discarded materials in context and ask each of the people here who they'd like to talk about, artists that they personally like who do this kind of thing. Just, just talk a little bit about it, what it means to, to them. To, you like beer too? Okay. Um, to them, because this, this kind of work that we're doing, or that people are doing, seems to be, be um, important to people, not only for political reasons, but also for economic reasons. So, um, Shana, maybe we could start with you and talk a little bit about, um, you know. Uh, that? That. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly well phrased question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's cool because we've, there's been a little, you know, not a whole lot of pregame, but a little bit. Um, and that actually is sort of my favorite part of it in a way, and this, is this whole topic, and I've been thinking about coming up here, um, is because, you know, there's a whole sort of like world of, you know, endless wonder to be had when you start to examine, you know, the dynamic of someone who looks at a pile of junk and sees something completely, you know, different, and then, you know, realizes it and like, sees, you know, an elbow pipe and, you know, starts to envision, you know, a cityscape or something. I mean, that's a, an amazing thing that I completely, you know, admire and, 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 and I appreciate. Um, but I also, just personally, because of the kind of art critic and the kind of education, art history and um, art historical training I had where there was, you know, a lot of sort of social issues factored into your analysis of the work. When I look at it, I also see um, a lot of crossover, even though there's maybe not, I'm not a, you know, putting intention on, onto the artists themselves, but for me as the sort of visual, you know, the audience, I feel like there's a lot of resonance with other aspects of things that society is up to, of you know, getting away from this culture of disposability in general, getting away from that in terms of our food and our clothes and, you know, our, our industrial designs and the materials and sustainability and, you know, there's a guy who does a TED talk where he'll build an entire house out of nothing but recycled materials. And that I think that it's, the visual arts is an amazing prism, it's an amazing place to examine that impulse, but I'm particularly in love with how similar it is to all of these other um, kinds of ways of being issues uh, in the world, you know, right now, and that it, the way that it interacts with that aspect of culture is particularly fascinating to me. And so, 
Yeah, I, I think that it kind of affects a lot. Also, of us. not instead of the work itself. Yeah. Which there are people here that are much better positioned to really, you know, get into that. But I just yeah. want to like layer that on there. Yeah. Well, I mean, Liz, you know, you do the, you do, you've been doing uh, exhibits about this kind of thing for for at least six years or so. But you've also developed that um, that uh, practice because of you know your business. Started. So, talk a little bit about how you got into this, um, you know, studying this kind of work and some of the artists you may be showing and that kind of thing. Well, I don't know if all of you are familiar with my store, but I have a store and I specialize in hardware and lighting dating from 1862 today. And we, I get box lots of things in continually that are broken or too long and can't go into the store. So, uh, I started creating these artist boxes so that artists would have the ability to be able to come into the store and make pieces with that instead of the functional items that uh, we need for architecture. And uh, with that in mind, you know, I started doing this diverted destruction show because I wanted to be able to offer this possibility to make work that would be shown in a gallery. And so with that, three years after I started the diverted destruction show, I started the workshops. And they've really been building, they're, they're really a lot of fun, and I do, I collect a lot of things from the store and also daily life. Um, this, the, the work has definitely evolved in this year. As he mentioned, we had a collaboration with the California African American Museum. I think that to just be placing and placing things on boards is not, you know, not, doesn't necessarily constitute making a piece of artwork. It's to be really clever and also to be pointed with the work is really what will drive the work and will excel the work. And so as time has gone on, there have been artists who are creating that kind of work. And also there's a precision to it um, that, that really I think is necessary to be valid as to be looked at as fine art. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a thing that I, really dig is that there's a long history of, of doing this kind of work. Um, you know, Keen Holtz before him, um, George Herms from Los Angeles has been doing it a long time. Ever since there's been this sort of, there ever been, ever since there's, there's been, you know, an economic factor involved in making work and people needed to use what they had in front of them, there's been the impulse, at least in the 20th, since the 20th century started, to make this kind of work. So maybe, um, Ezra, you might want to talk a little bit about that, or Peter, about how this sort of fits in. Well, the, the 20th century has been referred to as uh, the, uh, the this century of the collage, so you say the collage aesthetic, where uh, increasingly, and, uh, and in, in the digital age, we see it's a come to almost an apotheosis, that things are put on top of, paired with, and attached to other things in a way that uh, leaves those seams uh, apparent. You, uh, that the joining of, of, of disparate things, the seg the segging from, uh, from one condition to a, uh, a very disparate condition uh, is what our lives are increasingly, have become increasingly like since uh, since at least the First World War, if not before. <coughs> and not by accident, uh, the practice of collage as a, a, as an, a, a, a high artistic pursuit, uh, and something specifically a modern or modernist pursuit, begins with Picasso uh, and Brock uh, attaching, pa pasting papers to uh, their drawings and ultimately their paintings. And uh, uh, other other artists uh, in, and other movements picking up on this, whether uh, it's the futurists in Italy, the Dadaists in uh, Switzerland and Germany, and then France, uh, and the surrealists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and it starts pretty early, even in America, with a figure like Arthur Dove uh, or Joseph Stella, even um, that the uh, in fact. There was a survey called the Art of Assemblage, mounted at the, the Museum of Modern Art, 
1960-61, I believe it was. It was definitely 61. Might have gone into 62. Uh, that sur did an extensive survey of this kind of work, uh, and uh, and it was response in part to an emergence on both coasts in America of a great deal of people working this way, uh, of uh, welding uh, discarded pieces of, uh, of iron and steel and, uh, and, and, uh, and other metals together, uh, nailing things together, uh, building paintings, uh, and th this kind of thing. The, uh, in fact, the term assemblage was coined for that show. It obviously relates to collage, but the idea of an assemblage was a collage that goes, uh, that, uh, a freestanding collage, it, it goes spatial. And by that time, 1961, you even had a four-dimensional collage in the form of a happening. Uh, <laughs> we fast forward uh, 20 years to the 80s, where, we, where uh, this use of uh, material in the world uh, material not associated with the uh, uh, with traditional art making is incorporated into art making, except this time with the appropriationists uh, and and the and the bricolagists. They're using uh, material that is bought right out of the store. They go into uh, well, there were no 99 cent stores in the 80s, <laughs> but there, there were still Woolworths. They go into a Woolworths and they 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 buy uh, little gugaws and tchotchkes and things and. and come out and, it can, and uh, construct with those. And, and the only difference in, uh, in aesthetic from uh, the uh, working with uh, the uh, assemblages of the 50s and 60s was that the stuff was new. Mm -hmm. What they were commenting, uh, just as the artists of the 50s and 60s were commenting on the, 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 uh, the culture of, uh, of, of discard, the culture of, uh, of one-time use, the, uh, artist, the, the artists of the next generation were commenting on the consumer culture itself. In other words, uh, if the older artists were saying, why are we using these up and not reusing them? The uh, younger artists were saying, why are, we, uh, why are we needing these things at all? And by aestheticizing them, putting them into these strange situations where they created their own little theaters, theater of the object, uh, the artists of the 80s were, were re-examining uh, the thing and our need for stuff. It, it, it's, uh, I think if we did the show of, uh, that surveyed the art of assemblage over the past hundred uh, years and change, we'd call it the art of stuff. <laughs> so, um, Ezra, you were, you, were, you were talking a little bit before the show started, before, you know, before we came up here, about artists that you particularly thought should be mentioned. Would you like to talk a little bit about some of those? Oh, God. Uh, I don't know that I'm necessarily the one to talk about someone like... Well, I, I mean, I, I just sort of men, have mentioned a couple of, you know, very iconic sort of names. Like, the icon of the moment seems to be El Aransui uh, from Ghana, who you may be familiar with. He uses, oh, everything from, like, discarded aluminum and metal pieces from... Or, or glass from you know bottles and cans and God knows what and creates like <coughs> entire tapestries out of these materials and um, uh, I mean going back to like the, the you know the sort of eshed assemblage that Peter was referencing of, uh, you think of people like uh, Louise Nevelson or um, uh, you know, uh, oh, another one that I've mentioned to you about is very, 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 very current. He has a show up at the Bronx Museum in New York, uh, is Tony Fair. And it doesn't even, that's what I was going to add. Okay, here's, I'm getting back on track. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm like off track before I even get started. This is typical. Um, you know, I'm, it's always like, you know, for a journalist, it's always looking for the lead. Oh, there's the lead, the hidden lead. Um, uh, uh, Tony. It's not even necessarily about assemblage. I mean, assemblage is great. Um, uh, you know, there's been already, there's terrific stuff being made now. There was terrific stuff made in the, the 50s and 60s and the 70s. Um, and there will always be great stuff made. But, uh, you know, it's, it's about stuff that you simply find 
all around you. Um, this guy, Tony Fair, ha has a show that is uh, includes, amongst other things, um, buttons that he found. It's, it's found all over um, New York, and um, there are arrangements of these buttons. And then he, uh, in What's another, kind of all kinds of buttons. All kinds of buttons. But all, all, all having to do with clothing. Um, buttons usually, to me, connote some article of clothing. Yes. <laughs> I think he means like fastening thing or like yeah, they're all for like, Ike. Oh, right. yeah, they're fast. Or a hell me. button. Uh, no, they're they're clothing. <laughs> <they're laughs> <button. laughs> no, no, not garment. <laughs> Shimano. No, no, it's, 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 yeah. Is that the belly button? <laughs> so anyway, um, hot button. Uh, and, uh, you know, I see these collections of objects. I mean, I, I, I and also I think I think about the kind of art that, like, say, someone like Richard Tuttle would make uh, just a sort of these like very small configurations of objects. It's for me, it's all it's all about a, a kind of it's all about cultural resonance uh, in the here and now, but also you know reaching back into uh, memory, both near and distant. Um, uh, you know, it, it has to do with. Uh, you know, an, uh, an idea, I think. Uh, also, uh, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a, a meeting point of like idea and aesthetic. How you have certain ideas, you see things a certain way. The reason why you see them is because of the cultural sort of soup that we're all swimming through. And you, you mix something out of it, you know, and one thing at a time. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think about when you go back as far as uh, collage, you know, where it all begins, like at least in the 20th century, you know, they were coming out of a, a tradition. I mean, even when you think about Cubism, it's about a certain analysis of uh, an idea of making art, this kind of illusionism. That that is still really the foundational principle there, and he is when he's making this collage, he's like um, he's bringing in this kind of like very concrete resonance with the stuff around him, um, and you know obviously that has an you know aesthetic function in the piece too, but it's uh, uh, it's about this kind of you know, vibration, this kind of resonance. Um, and, and, and and it just goes forward from there, you know, and it extends outward um, yeah, ev with every kind of garbage, you yeah. know, um, every kind of commercial detritus, but, you know, not just commercial detritus now, just uh, anything that is available, what is at hand, you know, Right, when you think about Rauschenberg saying, I'm only going to use what, is what I can yeah. find in one square block yeah. of my studio today. Right. And that's, and he's, he sets himself that exercise, he does the walk, and that's what it, that's what it is. Yeah. And to work that way day after day has exactly what you're saying, more as an aesthetic function, but there's also this like experiential yeah, which thing. Which is interesting because yeah. he, he, what he does is he sets up uh, this performance yeah. parameter. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so the resulting uh, assemblage or collage or, or uh, painting combine uh, becomes a, a record of, of, a, of, a, of an activity carried out. Or, or, of, a day, or of a day in the life. Kind of well, place. exactly. And, yeah. and the quality uh, of a place. Uh, which, yeah. which, uh, which extends the abstract expressionist ethos of, you know, you and the paint and the painting and that, and you, you, you perform, and perform on the painting. Well, this performs in real life. Well, speaking of performing in real life, let's bring the artists in and talk to them about how they're doing, what they're doing, and how they're using memory and relationships between the memories, the things, the, the significant <coughs> things we attach to the objects we find, how we place those into a new context, and what that means for them as artists. So I'd like to start with you, um, and, and maybe talk about the things that resonate for you in your, you know, using recycled cardboard. How did you know a little bit about how that works for you and 
what is it what is it with the ramifications for your work well uh, you know one thing that occurred to me actually being here you know I mean the art for me the, this this artistic pursuit is very much like an internal one you know and more and more like the more I do I work with cardboard or any kind of sort of found materials you know it, it touches on all the stuff we talked before it was like I what I do, you know what I mean, like I live in sort of poverty level or whatever, and you just use what you can, you know, so the work is, it does touch on that, that, that idea of like the performance, right, like the art, the activity is the art, um, and you know, coming here, this experience of sort of being here, and like what am I going to do, I don't know, the space, I'll see when I get there, uh, I'll work with the materials on hand, and uh, you know, becomes this sort of meditation in a way, you know, um, and so being out here over the course of three days, meeting people, um, looking at the environment, kind of sitting with it, cutting the cardboard, putting it together, you know, and, uh, it's all, um, it's, it's part of a, an internal dialogue, you know, and in fact, I'll share with you this, like, working with cardboard the way I do, it's, you know, it's not about objects, right, it's much more of like the Alan Capro sort of happenings school of thought where it's just like we're gonna this is the the performance is the art right so um, you know oftentimes when I work with cardboard it's just a vehicle to have this dialogue between four or five other artists and whoever else shows up you know? um, and you know being here I met a young artist who just kind of his name's Stephen Walker man like blew my mind the kid's eight years old so, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he just, I was over here doing this and like, you know, his mom, he just ran over and started working with me, you know, and it wasn't even like, there was even like, what are you doing? He just knew what to do, you know, and it became this real sort of cool thing, and I, I'm seriously, I'm not saying that like to be like, this is a special, you know, like, it's not a trite thing I'm trying to say at all, this is a very sincere moment I had, and it was kind of incredible, actually, that like, you know, this kind of thing could happen, and come to find out the kid, you know, like, has a very similar upbringing to me, you know, <laughs> so I'm thinking that, oh, well, maybe, like, I played with boxes as a kid, you know, like, I may do, like, he maybe having the same experience, so, like, there's this, um, I don't know, this poem that's being played out over the years, you know, and somehow, whatever, that sort of, I guess like that energy attracts like some of the energy or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's really what gets to me most about the work is that it um it it needs uh, that lack of material, that lack of formality, in order to survive and to thrive. It doesn't need the special paint from the paint store or the brush or this or that. It doesn't require the Lamborghini requires what's there. It requires resourcefulness. That's exactly right. So I want to talk to you a little bit, or have you talk to them a little bit about what <laughs> your experience was like coming up here and, uh, you know, what you found when you got here and how it's been going, because I haven't caught up with you since I heard you were here, I heard you got here. So what, what do you, what, you know, talk to us a little bit about how materials mean, what materials that you get mean to you, because a lot of what Joe's work is about is materials people give to him that they know he wants, that they know he could use. Um, there's a particular sculpture that he did, which, uh, you know, this bird that he made out of shark's teeth, that someone knew he wanted shark's teeth, but he made a bird out of it. Instead of, like, going with the fish thing, he went with the bird thing, with the shark's teeth, because and there was a specific reason for it. This was in downtown L.A. So talk, talk a little bit about what doing and and how you feel about being here and whatever it is you want to you want to talk about in terms of the like, experience of finding things or being given things. Well first of all I want to thank you for the hospitality. It's, uh, it's been a beautiful experience to be here. Um, my work is uh, made out of trash, it's made out of anything. Uh, I don't really see trash, I see Kind of, uh, I mean, not kind of, but just, just very, the 
destructive in a way, where uh, we, uh, we use things and uh, when they don't have its, uh, its original uh, design, doesn't have its purpose anymore, we throw it away and, and, and discard it. Um, I, I take those things and I make art out of it, and uh, I put it out <coughs> to different places and, and have people paint on it, and the discussion starts there. You know, the discussion starts while people are having their, their their moment as an artist because they're helping me um, create the piece also. Um, I like to share a lot of experiences I've had in my life and this is one way that, that I could uh, call myself a, an artist um, by teaching people um, the way I can uh, um, what I'm doing with all this trash. Um, I, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess I started in uh, 2006, just uh, uh, really good in sculpture class, really good in art, and um, I have a, a certain aesthetic that I, I, I just, uh, I guess, uh, born with, but um, I, uh, sorry, well, that's cool, that's cool, so, um, um, yeah, I mean, what do you think about, what do you think about what you're doing now, the, the piece you're working on here at the show, how's it coming? It was going good. I mean, um, I was asked to do this three months ago, and um, I, I didn't know what to expect, basically. I just knew that I was going to have uh, my wire, and uh, we were going to look around all the dumpsters. Uh, so yesterday, we, uh, we went dumpster diving, and um, <laughs> I just picked up pieces along the way, and uh, had it all in front of me, and uh, I, what, what stays the same is, is the theme, the theme of sharing with people um, my uh, my trash you know, my, <laughs> my life, yeah. and um, I, I, I like doing that I, I like um, when people come in and, and paint on my work you know, paint on, on, on sculptures and, um, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing when I first started doing it that uh, people were just uh, they fell into it. You know, I didn't have to tell them uh, you have to put the green with the green, or you have to paint it this way. They they, they just uh, took it on themselves. You know, just like what you said, you know, that uh, little boy. You know, he came in, just uh, popped in, and uh, you'd be amazed how many people would do that. You know, uh, if you have paint and, and brushes just lying out there, they'll just say, "Oh, thank you." you know? And uh, it was uh, it was my form of art. You know, it wasn't art that that belonged in the museum per se, but uh, you could touch this. You could you could uh, uh, paint on it, and and it was okay. You know, I um, I wanted it to be uh, uh, something personal that I can give them, and um, something that that wasn't there every day. But I just did it because. You know, I, um, I don't know. I I, I was not an artist. Uh, I I kind of made myself into an artist. I made myself. Um, go to these places and take my sculptures with me and uh, just open it up for everyone and um, what I got was uh, a community forming, a community just, just there uh, helping me. So um, it's been, I would say magical, it's been um, kind of uh, how I feel uh, humans are. Um, we're all creative souls. Just we're, we're trapped in, in our uh, superstitions. You know, we're, we're trapped in. Uh, you you are an office worker, and that's all you're going to be. And you can't paint because uh, you're only doing numbers. You know, it's. Uh, um, I mean, if that was the case, then I, I would be stuck doing diesel engines and and uh, working a nine to five like, like always. But um, I found art. Um, art found me, and I'm showing people how much I love to do art by helping them, I guess, by, uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost. No, no, it's okay. So, um, I think, I think what's really, what's really w at work here, at work here in this subject right now is how these materials that people find, these discarded things that people find, people see something in. They see a spirit in it. 
beyond what some people would say, but you know, uh, there's an artist that um, that uh, Liz shows. His name is Timothy Washington, and he says in the documentary that we worked on that um, the older he gets, the more he sees life in everything, in every object, whether it's discarded some, something that's been manufactured or in wood. Or I mean, he makes art out of you know spoons. You know, he makes art out of spoons in some cases. Um, so the question I would have sort of round table thing would be how do how do objects that have been discarded take on more meaning than you know suddenly become something way more than than what they and they were when you looked at them at the first moment on the ground how does that translate into the aesthetic I'm just kind of fishing here but I think that's one well, of the one person things. that we didn't talk about yet is Al Hansen Right, who, you know, aside from being Beck's granddad, um, is famous for making those um, Venus, Hershey Venus collages, right, where it's the tin foil part of the inside of the Hershey wrapper. And it's these, you know, sort of like punky kind of nudes, but they're also very shiny, and they get at a lot of this, like, you know, question about, you know, it's, an, it's fancy, expensive art because I've made it into that, even though you can still plainly see that it's a crumpled up candy wrapper. But that there's also, it's not just, crumpled up candy wrapper. You now have access to the entire gene pool of the branding and the nostalgia and the memory and the context of the thing that you're using. So it's not only that there's raw materials that are can inspire you formally in a kind of amazing visual pun or kind of epiphany or you know, but also you if you choose to work this way, um, you can make a comment about a whole range of aspects of social experience and art history uh, with very few gestures because it's shorthand for all this other stuff that you're choosing to bring into the kind of backstory of what you're doing. So um, I don't know if it would have worked as well if it were like Toblerone Venuses, right? But it was Actually, her she Venus and there's her she, right. right? Right in there and that kind of mother worship, nostalgia, American mass produced childhood you know, kind of thing happening, as well as a critique of the preciousness of the art object, um, but it was still familiar, it wasn't like aggressive or hostile, it was freaking childhood, man, right? So you have all this amazing push-pull, and he didn't create any of that, he just refined it by the way that he used what was already there, and so, you know, it had to be discarded only, you know, but only because the chocolate had to be taken out. And then building building on that, you had uh, an artist who, uh, who knew how, uh, like Hannah Wilkie, building on the whole oral fixation right. in, this, in, in the, 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 the literal consumption and doing all these sculptures with uh, with chewed gum. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, she uh, I mean, she worked with uh, she worked with ceramics. She worked with paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, always dealing with uh, vaginal forms. But then she hit on chewing gum, and uh, and started build, uh, building these uh, these these little and then not so little uh, shapes made out of uh, out of chew, chewed gum, which she didn't always chew. Uh, I was the first, actually, the first person to chew gum for her. I saw. I think she created this little collage. Her first one. Her first one actually had a piece of the uh, a piece of the. Uh, of the wrapping paper in there. I think, uh, I think she favored Wrigley's over beach stuff. Uh, you, know. you, know, uh, you know, I love what you said about superstitions and about, because what, what's interesting about this kind of work is that y you can use these kinds of objects to kind of deconstruct the superstition. You can, you can, uh, you can create your own kind of, uh, kind of spirit element or and or while you are sort of taking it apart, examining it, like why is this so invested? Um, whether it's, you know, simply commercially, whether it's uh, in terms of a kind of industrial ethos, whether it's uh, 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 culturally, spiritually, aesthetically, uh, sexually, why um, we, the way we treat objects, um, so many different things in them. 
in their shapes, um, in the way we use them, the way we hold them. All of that is sort of uh, becomes grist for the artist's mill, and it's it's you know it also le one thing leads to another. Where you it's you know I, I was talking about buttons early, earlier, and you know this kind of configuration that this artist made of them, but it can be you know someone mentioned spoon that you know you could have a spoon and something else and, and uh, placed against a, a, another thing and suddenly it takes on a completely different meaning or you see a different meaning and, and those things themselves that new configuration or the old configuration has a certain kind of place a kind of and a, a uh, it, it's very resonant and very, uh, um, you know, uh, porous too. Uh, you, I, I, I like that idea, um, and I think a lot of artists do that. And um, you know, it, it, it can be these things are configured in any number of different ways. I mean, we see, for example, in like. You know, an artist like uh, Joseph Cornell using certain things like, you know, uh, clay pipes or, you know, little, you know, um, uh, you know, balls or things, you know, from jacks or something or, or you know, little uh, um, cheap reproductions of um, uh, classical uh, paintings or, or maps or things like that. Just, and, and sort of just uh, rearranging their shapes to, to tell it whether it's to tell a story, it's not necessarily to tell a story. The object itself may or may not tell, uh, tell a story. It, 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 it's incomplete, it's open-ended. And um, you, you know, one gives form to that. One takes the form apart and then one gives a new form to it. And, and you, you have this kind of conversation. And it's a, it's a conversation that, as, as, as you both said, it's a, that, that more than one artist or um, a craftsperson can add to can add to, can subtract to, and the viewer takes something away from that. Um, th that's something I find very interesting because it, it goes back to, and it's something that I think we're rediscovering culturally, is uh, because that goes back to ancient culture. Because we are at a point where we're sort of uh, exhausting, certainly we're exhausting uh, the material resources of the planet, and. Um, and certainly we've exhausted a certain kind of cultural tradition. And so we're going back to that, um, to, to sort of, uh, to very fundamental ways of forming and making meaning and um, having a conversation with those meanings. It's, it's all a kind of, you know, discourse of meaning. But um, we have this in a very, you know, tactile way. Um, so uh, that I find very a little bit about this, or ask you to talk a little bit about this, but you work in a place where, you know, there's all these things coming in one place all of a sudden, and, and it's, it's been <coughs> firmly been discarded <coughs> around, around in the street or whatever, and, um, um, you know, the, the, the idea that Ezra was talking about, about using what's in front of you, goes back to the ancient, to the caves, you know, because we, you, they used the charcoal or whatever that was in front of them, or they ground up stuff and they sprayed it on the wall or whatever, and because it's limestone, it became permanent, it was the first uh, frescoes, you know, so people have always looked to what was nearby to make work, and um, so maybe talk a little bit about how that works with the program you work in, and what kinds of things have you seen? artists come up with that sort of talk about that whole, um, you know, way of, you know, way of working. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the founder of our program, who's a lesser known artist and an environmentalist and an activist. Um, her name is Jo Hansen. She passed away a few years ago. Very influenced by Muriel Lukely, who was an environmental artist. Um, but Jo, she bought a house in the Lower Haight in San Francisco, which is a neglected, uh, neglected neighborhood underserved neighborhood, but she bought a house on the corner, and it was very windy, 
so she just started she started sweeping and that became her art track. So she started sweeping and she collected everything that was blowing around. So it was like letters, love letters, syringes, and she created these really they weren't beautiful scrapbooks, but they were very compelling and they documented the time and the place, that particular time and place. So so then she expanded this this idea of street sweeping and she involved the kids and Mayor Diane Feinstein started street sweeping the streets <coughs> and eventually was invited out to our facility and, and, and I work at the DOM. I work for a recology which is San Francisco's recycling and composting company. And she this was in nineteen ninety, in the late eighties, she couldn't believe she absolutely was astonished at what we threw away. I mean this is twenty three years later and I still am astonished at what we threw away. And San Francisco is supposed to be this very environmentally conscious city. And it's you know, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. We buy stuff we don't need and it's like you said, the, the, the we're running out of we are going to run out of materials. We're gonna start mining the landfills to get materials for the future generations. So so she came, she she pitched the idea to to our uh, upper management. She said we have to get artists out there, and we had just started curbside recycling. They thought what a perfect way to get people to think about the environment, think about sustainability, think about like very basic recycling and composting. Which actually, composting isn't that basic. You could change, you could alleviate a lot of the problems with composting. But anyway, <laughs> I could go on and on about that. But. They said, yeah, let's do it. And since 1990, we've had we've worked with over 100 Bay Area artists. They have a studio space. Josh was one of our artists. Um, they have a studio space, a uh, gallery space, a lot of administrative support, and a shopping cart. So they have to go out into the dump area. That's their job. And they, the studio's empty, and they go shopping. And it is like shopping. I mean, people throw away, right? Like yeah. when you were there, it was, it's unbelievable. Jewelry and food that's so good. And just like and wood, it's yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, wood and glass, and all glass kinds. And it's There's that TED Talk guy who builds entire houses out of nothing, out of but right with the license plate shingles and the whole thing. You could build a house I mean, in one day. You could buy enough materials to buy a little tiny house in, in two and hours. And something great looking. I mean, that's the other aspect yeah. of it. Is it's not been like you look like you made your house out of garbage. Out of garbage. It's <laughs> this magical, incredible thing with all this story and imagination that is something that you want right you know it's not like a compromise you know what i mean you're not it's not sacrificing a we do have and a there's wonderful program there yeah. but are other people also allowed to go there or no. do have to be part of the residency it's program? it's funny because i thought you know we've i've been there for a while but we thought there would be more residency programs starting like this but no company companies don't want to take on the liability and they don't want to pay our artists get paid they have a lot of administrative support and we don't want to take on the liability of somebody else taking care of well that's a bunch yeah, of artists when and we golf carts in the dump and like no supervision. <laughs> they possibly go wrong. <laughs> yeah. In Santa yeah. Monica, there weren't even much to go in there and take pictures. So that was what the complaint was with one of the artists that was on the, the panel, right. was that you cannot find materials anymore. Which I, I said, I disagree. Oh, so I disagree. There's I there's so think that there's too. a lot of materials <laughs> out there on the street. You just oh, have yeah. to be willing to stop your car and throw it in. And, and the and artists in our program, they don't, they're, we don't, they're not all sculptors. I mean, in the beginning they were sculptors, but now we have performance artists and conceptual. Stephanie Studuco is there right now. We have um, uh, we had a composer who <coughs> built a score called Junkestra that was performed at a symphony performance. So it's it runs the gamut, but it's <coughs> it's unbelievable and it's discouraging. I also want to say that you know, for me, some of the earliest environmental artists, which are very different from the artists that just use raw materials for economic reasons, are, it's a very it's totally different. The conceptual intent is different. And like the Harrisons, you know, in the 70s they did, they did this project because we're running out of topsoil. What? We can't grow food without topsoil. They made their own topsoil. I mean, that's the kind of, those, so it's like the, that kind of performative act that really can change the world. And we're hoping with our program, you know, that we can reach people in a different way than, you know, handing out a flyer that says recycle this. We hope that we can reach people through their homes. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, the, 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 I think the main, one of the really, you know, the economic issue becomes not only like a necessity for the artist, but it also becomes, it's part of why bottles and cans began to be recycled more often in the 70s, because they made them valuable. And so value is now, things are getting so scarce, the value of 
replaced in trash so that it become commercially viable to actually, you know, and in this country, unlike some other countries, we need the commercial uh, motivation to do anything good, which that's probably too big of an issue for, you know, <laughs> tonight, but, um, but um, I'd like to maybe open it up to the audience to ask anybody here any questions they'd like. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. And, um, and if anybody, anybody has any questions? Yeah. I don't know if I have questions. I just have answers. <laughs> ah. But uh, what I want to say, and that's why I came here, I guess, is that I really welcome you, all of you, in the name of myself. Because I have been 17 years, you know, I'm doing this kind of work. And I may be the 1% in the 99% of artists that do this kind of work, more professionally, should I say, where we have amazing artists here, geniuses, you know, and incredibly good artists. And what they do is probably coming from an economical need where they do what sells which is very beautiful landscape, very beautiful food, very beautiful flowers. And that, in a way, I, 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 it, it, it was an effort, I should confess, to keep doing this. Maybe because I'm not poor anymore, I can afford it. But in a way, it made me feel like a preacher, standing on my stand, you know. I think this is good what I'm doing, and I think I should keep doing it, in spite of not being able to sell, or in spite of people telling me, in my case, it's interesting, but aren't you of the world? Aren't you real? <laughs> you know, these things you are doing, you know, using discarded objects and trash. So, I, I think it came from that kind of inspiration. I believe in it. Yes, I did believe in it since I was young because I was poor. And to me, keeping any object was a good idea because Eventually, I didn't even know why, but eventually I could reuse them or find something to do with them. Now I'm happy because everything I, I <laughs> gather eventually finds a destination. A and then when, when it comes more to why, I, I think that uh, in a way, uh, aesthetics has a lot to do with it. It, it reminds me of the very famous Louise Nevelson that was mentioned here before, who as, as a little girl <coughs> and out of boredom was kind of gathering pieces of wood in her father's shop and putting them together in little crates, in little boxes and only when she put them together massively, just because she was <laughs> trying to make space, she didn't have where to put them, she looked and saw the grandiosity of her work and that's when she became famous but she, when she had it, because she flourished late and somebody in one of these shows asked her, Luis, uh, can you tell me, is, is that a, a toilet bowl? And she looked back and she said, no, idiot, it's an oval. <laughs> <laughs> so in many ways I feel very, I see shapes. And, and I do believe that we are, like they say, we are what we eat. We are in art also what we eat. We we, we give importance to objects that may be very different. Like I, I, I uh, people that know my work know that I like to be uh, poking in people's hearts, you know, and confronting them. And I love the fight and the, the message and the dialogue. So when the bear was killed, a bear that came down from the mountain and uh, was killed because he just wanted to eat and drink. And, and people thought that the, the person in charge felt that the bear should be killed because there were a hundred people gathered there. I, I was very, very sad. And I took a Winnie the Pooh and I crucified it. So that was the largest Oh my God. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, are there bears here? <laughs> 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 That's what I'm sorry. I guess that wasn't really the point that I was supposed to take away from that. But 
Uh, that's why we're having this discussion out here in the dark. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, they're, All right. They're looking at us. Bear baiting. So Winnie the Pooh crucified. I'm guessing you got some feedback. Well, obviously, I found that Winnie, that was awesome, you know, a beautiful, big, large Winnie. The, gather at the, the guy at the gift shop gave it to me instead of $2. When I told him what I was going to do with him, it was, he said, take it for free. So I took it and I crucified it. <laughs> and it got me a real trouble. You know, people gathered. Some people were very offended by it and gathered <laughs> signatures to get that work out of the art center. Where yeah, it was you, going you, to know, you know, you make an interesting point, which is about, and again, it goes back to the issue of memory. So much of our culture, I mean, I actually have to tell you that's A.A. A. Milne, and I love Winnie the Pooh. I love bears, too. I love nature. I love wildlife. I love, I love life but so much of our so much of our so much of, so much of our culture so much of our culture and i don't mean a a milne but um but i mean like so so the disnification of a a milne so much of our culture is is so is about is the opposite of memory it's about amnesia uh, which has to do a primary uh, first and foremost with uh, our forgetting the fact that we've overrun the bloody planet and certainly this part of the world, and uh, overdeveloped it, over-industrialized it, over-destroyed it. We basically destroyed it. And so, um, and I, what I, I like about your gesture, as, as rough as it is on sensibilities, you know, ridiculously corrupted and, and, and <laughs> fragile <laughs> sensibilities as mine, um, is that it sort of has to shakes out of their, you know, cute amnesia. They're like, you know, uh, you know, like, oh, but it's okay. But you the know, also like, thing no. is, like, it's Winnie the Pooh, right? Yeah. So it's not just a bear, a stuffed bear, a taxidermy bear, a painting of a bear. It's like, and your childhood, whoever yeah. you are. Yeah. yeah. So that because you yeah. found this uh, object like that it, already yeah. has yeah. all that yeah. backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the discussion yeah. 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 made it one of the happiest days in my life. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I've been asked because it's a little bit too late. Yeah. Gather the natural to get my work out of the city. Like yeah. And she was told that cannot be done, but since we were having open studios, she told her, why don't you go and talk to the artists? Her studio is yeah. open, you can talk to her. Yeah. Somebody called me and said, she's coming. <laughs> 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 and so I kind of agreed. I think I was ready from before. I tried to I dare to do that. I kind of knew I was getting in hot water because it was windy and it was the cause. So yeah. her message was, how dare you to kill Winnie? <laughs> you know, the, our idol, the stuffed animal that uh, me and my grandchildren talk constantly about and read books. And on my cross, how dare you? And I said to her, I, I, I didn't tell you already, you know, I said to her, you know, I'm a grandmother too, no intention to offend you, nor Winnie, nor anyone. I, it was just indeed a, a, an act done with the purpose of calling attention. You know you, that you the religious symbol it. of that category will call attention. Yeah. And I yeah. want to tell you, I feel that if you talk with your grandchildren about what you saw and how it affected you, it might be very good for, for them. Yeah, yeah. So I, I came out of it very happy. <laughs> well, <laughs> so it, you know, that, that, story is, that story is amazingly cool because it resonates in so many different ways. And I think, um, you know, I think this show, this discarded show has done that for a lot of people and uh, we we really are proud to be here and we want to thank you for being here and being our audience and uh, sticking with us and letting us uh, blather on about what we love and, sure. and, and we appreciate it very much. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for making the trip personally. It was a trip. And, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Joe and Joshua, Liz, Deborah, Ezra, Shana, and Peter. And thank you all for coming. And I just want to make an announcement. We want to thank you, and we have a gift for you at Modern Folk, all the panelists. So oh. Please, before you go back over the porch, go um, into the storage. It's right inside, and you'll, you'll see it. And it's, it's actually made from, made from the <laughs>